I'm glad that Chaplain Greg got to meet the really wonderful member of my household. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart truly magnify Christ, uh, whose present, in whose name we seek your presence now. Amen. This sermon shares its title, Strange Glory, with a recent biography of the German pastor-theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It is very appropriate to contemplate Jesus' transfiguration during Lent as we begin heading resolutely toward the cross, knowing that the glory of Easter will come, but only after suffering. So this revelation of Jesus' glory seems strange. Much of the strangeness is perennial. Peter blurted out nonsense because, like any of us would be, he was overwhelmed by what was happening. Yet some of the apparent strangeness is contemporary. We Americans have just completed our annual Super Bowl rituals in which we worship visual and economic excess. Side note, Matthew Stafford's win is the closest that I, as a Detroit Lions fan, will ever get to this kind of glory. Well, in that light, how could it make any sense to us for God to reveal Jesus' glory privately? Bonhoeffer provides another, far lesser, example of the strangeness at stake. Bonhoeffer would not be very famous if it were not for what seems like defeat, being hanged by Nazi Germany just days before the Allied liberation of his prison camp. Mark tells us about the transfiguration in a way that not only shows us Jesus, but also tells us about ourselves. Our passage leads us first through the transfiguration itself, then back to the Old Testament preparation for Jesus, and finally forward to the implications for bearing witness to God's glory in Jesus. We begin with verse 1 because the transfiguration itself in verses 2 and 3 somehow fulfills Jesus' promise at the very start of the chapter. After making the first of three predictions regarding his crucifixion in chapter 8, verses 31 through 38, and challenging followers not to shrink back from his cross, Jesus concludes, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death, before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Depending on how you interpret the rest of Mark's gospel, that statement may apply to more than the transfiguration, but it surely includes it. Mark 9.2 underscores the connection with the time marker that the transfiguration occurred only a few days later. Jesus took with him an inner circle of three disciples and went up a high mountain. There, according to Mark 9, 3, his clothes became dazzlingly, impossibly white, and Matthew's gospel adds that his face shone like the sun. The gospels do not dwell on the details. How could they? Human words cannot handle this divine glory. This was the proverbial mountaintop experience to end all others. When the transfiguration led these disciples to turn their eyes on Jesus, the things of earth really did grow strangely dim. But not totally. Maximus the Confessor represents many church fathers in finding the event to be important, more important than we Protestants, frankly, and in highlighting Jesus' use of created things to reveal his glory. The transfiguration involved the eternal divine son brightening a human face along with garments made from the stuff of the surrounding world. The transfiguration manifests not only the divine glory, but also the glorified humanity of the incarnate son and the goodness of the material world. Creaturely involvement in divine revelation is also reflected in a second aspect of the event to which verses 4 through 7 point us. The Old Testament preparation for Jesus, signaled by his dialogue with Moses and Elijah. At some level, Peter and the others understand that divine revelation is unfolding here. But Peter's proposal in verse 5 reflects the disciples' inadequate categories. 
Peter addresses Jesus as rabbi, teacher, true as far as it goes, but not far enough. Tradition has it that Peter himself is Mark's most fundamental source, so we get this evaluation straight from the horse's mouth. In ignorant terror, Peter blurts out a proposal that puts Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah, pretty high, but not high enough. This association with Moses and Elijah also suggests treating him as a prophet, which was probably the default category that the people of Jesus' day would have had for traveling preachers like him. But the Old Testament preparation signaled here goes even farther than prophets. Several connections are possible, or even likely. One, Moses may represent the law and Elijah the prophets. Moses had a founding and Elijah a renewing ministry for God's people that Jesus now fulfills. Their prophetic testimony pointed to this one in whom God is more fully and personally revealed. Two, both of them specially encountered God on mountains, although without being able to see the divine being directly. Three, both were forerunners of the Messiah. Four, both avoided normal human death. Five, yet both suffered due to, due to the resistance of God's people. And six, the proposed shelters may evoke the tabernacle or, more likely, the booths for the Feast of Tabernacles, even if they arise simply from the disciples' misguided effort in the first instance to share in a momentous occasion. Well, God responds to Peter's proposal in verse 7. The disciples have heard this voice before at Jesus' baptism. This is my son, whom I love, taking up the language of the Psalms for the Davidic king and using it in a heightened fashion for the messianic son of God. To underscore that higher identity, this time the voice adds, listen to him. Valuing the voices of Moses and Elijah as preparatory, but in no sense rivals for the incarnate son. The divine voice speaks while a cloud overshadows them. Just as a cloud overshadowed God's people in Moses' day when they were redeemed from Egypt and led into the promised land, just as the Holy Spirit overshadowed, same word, the Virgin Mary, from the very first moment of the divine son's incarnation in her womb. And just as, in between, a cloud is often associated with the revelation of divine glory in Theophanies. The implication of these Old Testament comparisons and contrasts, Jesus dialoguing with Moses and Elijah, but the disciples being told that they must listen ultimately to him, is that Christ fulfills the testimony and vocation of these forerunners so that now he has relocated Israel's sacred space around himself. In and through him, the people will encounter God without an accompanying Aaron or a Levitical priesthood. When, thirdly, the passage moves from Old Testament preparation into developing the Transfiguration's implications for Christian witness, what happens in verse 8 focuses our attention. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Other earthly authorities fade in significance. In 2 Peter 1, we are told that this event makes the divine origin and truth of the New Testament's testimony all the more certain because some of the apostles were eyewitnesses of this profound event. Yet, coming down from the mountaintop experience, Jesus orders them not to tell about it until after his resurrection, verse 9, about which the disciples do not understand, verse 10. They are stuck on Elijah and matters of timing. Verse 11, when and how can God's kingdom come with power if Elijah hasn't returned yet in the way that Malachi foretold? Jesus' answer in verses 12 and 13 is that Elijah's anticipated return has been fulfilled in the preparatory ministry of John the baptizer. But Israel's defiled sanctuary was not yet cleansed in the way that Malachi seemed to promise the religious and political establishment treated the Messiah's forerunner just like they once treated Elijah. Here is another instance of Mark's so-called messianic secret. 
Jesus, avoiding the title Messiah for most of his ministry, telling his disciples not to proclaim that identity openly because it would simply be misunderstood as a merely human rival to the establishment. This misunderstanding of the Messiah, however, was not just an external problem. It's not just that the establishment would misunderstand and clamp down, or that the ignorant crowds would misunderstand and champion a populist revolt. Jesus' disciples themselves misunderstood. To feel the extent and the force of their misunderstanding, we glance at the surrounding stories in Mark's gospel. They form a pattern. In Mark 8, beginning at verse 22, at basically the halfway mark of the gospel, Jesus heals a blind man with an interesting result. The initial healing through spit on the man's eyes leaves him seeing, but only partially. People look fuzzy, kind of like you do now, honestly, like trees walking around to a middle-aged man with poor eyesight. Jesus lays his hands on the man's eyes again, even more directly, and then his sight is fully restored. Mark narrates this miracle as a kind of parable for the disciples' spiritual state. Their sight has been healed, but only partially. The next story contains Peter's confession of Jesus as Messiah in response to a survey of inadequate contemporary views of Jesus' identity. But Jesus responds to Peter's confession by telling them to keep it secret for the time being. They do not yet understand, as they need to, that the Son of Man must suffer rejection, be killed and rise again. At this, Peter tries to rebuke Jesus and in return is rebuked with, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Here, the first prediction of Jesus' passion came right before the transfiguration. And what was the aftermath? We might expect that the transfiguration would fully heal the disciples' spiritual sight. The three would urge the others to listen carefully to Jesus' strange predictions about death and resurrection. But what actually happened? Immediately following the transfiguration in Mark 9, 14 through 29, while healing a demon-possessed boy, Jesus is exasperated with an unbelieving generation because the disciples cannot accomplish the healing since they pray in relative unbelief. Then Jesus predicts his death a second time. And do the disciples get it? We can also make, almost make a liturgy out of it. No. As Mark 9 concludes and Mark 10 begins, the disciples become preoccupied with stopping rival ministries at risk of causing little ones to stumble rather than welcoming them to Jesus. Later in Mark 10, beginning at verse 32, Jesus provides his third passion prediction. And do the disciples get it? No. James, you're, you're a little Presbyterian there. Uh, I can say that because I, I know them. James and John, two of the three disciples who enjoyed the mountaintop experience of the transfiguration, ask for places of honor in Jesus' heavenly kingdom. Convinced now of his divine glory, in a way, they try to grab as much as possible for themselves. And the other ten respond indignantly, concerned not for Jesus' glory, but for their own missed opportunities. Jesus intervenes in Mark 10, 42 through 45. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In the next story, blind Bartimaeus responds in faith and receives his sight. At that point, Jesus heads to Jerusalem, and the disciples recede to the background for a while. So the transfiguration revealed Jesus' divine glory, but it did so while anticipating the cross, when, as John's gospel ironically suggests, Jesus would be most highly lifted up. Jesus' glory is strange, not just to the world, but also to his disciples, especially in a modern world that values marketing techniques. We marvel that God would display the glory of his son so privately to just three disciples. Would not many people believe, we often think, if they could see something like the transfiguration? 
We may marvel, too, that Jesus' disciples could be so obtuse, but we have the benefit of hindsight, and even the three disciples in the inner circle did not readily embrace the Jesus that the transfiguration actually revealed. And I'm not sure that you and I do either. Now, this event does contain both revelation and reassurance. Jesus is the eternally glorious Son of God incarnate, and his cross and resurrection do secure an eternal victory. The transfiguration's temporary display of his eternal glory and restatement of his Father's enduring love would reassure even Jesus in his humanity as he faced the cross. It could also reassure fledgling disciples then and now helping us to take up our crosses by revealing the Son of Man's eternal glory. But along with revelation and reassurance comes the need for repentance, a change of perspective about Jesus' strange glory. His awesome majesty was revealed to tell disciples to listen. Its apex displayed power that was perfected in weakness on a Roman cross. Its strange glory reassured disciples of forgiving love, reflecting divine power that can even accomplish its will by taking on human suffering. Thus, the transfiguration does not apply to us by focusing on what Jesus' disciples are called to accomplish. There's not a to-do list. Instead, it calls for repentance, a change in our perspective coming to see Jesus in the way that Mark's narrative calls for so that we take up our cross, not our social reputations or our devotional duties or our evangelistic techniques or our political crusades. We won't be passive, far from it, but we will actively serve in the name of the one who avoided rather than embraced the potential for making a self-interested splash. In this Lenten season, I am pondering what such repentance means for my discipleship. It might mean speaking God's word even when you're not especially talented at it, or you don't fit the cultural expectations of how to do it. Or it might mean receiving compliments when God blesses your ministry, but struggling to do so in a way that truly glorifies the Savior and gradually overcomes your felt need for affirmation. Your specific challenges will differ from my personal illustrations here, but we all face the challenge of serving a savior who makes it strange for us to navigate how to relate to near-term earthly success or its absence. From German prison cells, Bonhoeffer wrote numerous letters in which he contemplated who is Jesus Christ for us today. In his context, he felt that it would be a mistake for the church to oppose modern confidence simply by pointing out human weakness and providing religion as a crutch to keep needy people dependent. He famously wrote that in Jesus, God let himself be pushed out of the world and onto a Roman cross. Only the suffering God can help. That statement does not reflect the classical precision I prefer as a Presbyterian, but it does poetically point to the strange glory of the transfigured Jesus. In a time of pandemic trauma and political turmoil, our lives are easily tantalized by media spectacles, or at least taken up with promoting ourselves and our causes. To be sure, our transfigured savior is revealed as the Son of God, who reassures us that everything the Old Testament prepared for will be fulfilled. There is a victory to proclaim. But this moment of revelation also calls disciples to repentance, so that we may bear witness to the strange glory of our Savior, who is not a self-inflated celebrity, but a suffering servant. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.